Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Raja Dhar. I head the Department of Pulmonology at Fortis in Kolkata. A warm welcome to you for the fourth and final in the series of advanced PFT workshops that have been organized by PACS and has been endorsed by the Indian Chess Society. A big thank you to Schiller for having given their support for these meetings. Today's session is on CPET Advanced. And the speaker today is none other than Dr. Deepak Talwar. I won't waste your time trying to um, introduce Deepak. Um, I have learned from Deepak on numerous occasions. And I was telling him just before the meeting started that I'm especially nervous today because I'm going to just attend the master class and coordinate things rather than being a faculty in this meeting today. So I look forward to this session and learning about advanced PFT. So Dr. Talwar is the senior consultant chairman at Metro Center for Respiratory Disease, Diseases in Noida. We'll do this session for about two hours. We would ask you to send your questions in during the course of the meeting, and we'll try and answer those questions at the very end. So without wasting further time, I'll hand over to Dr. Talwar. Deepak, all yours to start off the meeting. Thank you, Raja. Good evening, everyone. You are always very, very modest. There is nothing which you do not know or what you need to understand more. That is very clear to everyone it should be. And uh, this is your modesty. And we all have seen it uh, almost every day. And every day we see it, relish it and cherish it also. So today, yes, we have a little difficult topic. We are on the grand finale of this advanced lung function test. And I think nothing could be more difficult than an advanced uh, C patch session, which is uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing. And uh, no doubt we have seen in our previous uh, series that uh, people have heard about it, they know about it, but they find it complex, they find it difficult to understand, and they want to use it, but they do not know how to use it. So obviously, I think there, is, uh, there are, in fact, a lot of limitations in uh, utilizing this uh, uh, modality which is perhaps one of the, as I discussed in the last uh, meeting also in the basics, that it is one of the most important investigation for dyspnea of unknown origin, which is a very common uh, scenario of presentation in uh, uh, pulmonologist practice where they get lots of patients with dyspnea and you really do not know whether this is uh, clearly respiratory, cardiac or multiple causes. And that's what we discussed last time that uh, in the exercise testing, what we need to do is elicit the organ systems responses. And we do it to such a level that the one of the organ system fails. And that gives us a clue that if this patient has got exercise limitation, is not able to have the amount of exercise or activity which is, which is required for him, uh, had he been normal, then now which is the organ which is limiting. So, so it is stretching an organ to such an extent where that organ says or cries that I cannot do any more. And that's what you need to detect on this uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing. And we do understand that uh, it's, it's a test which looks very, very complicated. But all it does is basically just three things that it measures the oxygen which you take in, carbon dioxide which comes out, the oxygen which comes out, and of course the volume of air which you move in with each breath. So it's a breath by breath analysis and the analyzer has got uh, three things to do. It is constantly online analyzer for oxygen, for carbon dioxide and for volume. So you can actually look at the ventilation you can see the amount of oxygen moved in, amount of oxygen which has come out, the amount of oxygen which was there, carbon dioxide which was there, when, and of course the amount of carbon dioxide which you have exhaled out. So the entire respiration, which is a process in the mitochondria, which actually utilizes the glucose to produce ATP for contraction of the muscle, produces carbon dioxide by taking oxygen inside. So the internal respiration, which is occurring in the tissue level in the mitochondria, is going to be transported across the lungs because it is the duty of the lungs to provide for that extra oxygen required by the tissues and take care of extra carbon dioxide, which is produced by them. And that is what we are going to measure in a CPAT test. And obviously, the patient is going to make this by doing an exercise, which is to the limit of limitation. What is the limit of limitation is when the patient says, I can't do anything more. 
So this is totally different from our leisurely test, which is six minute walk test or other, or other similar kind of exercise test in which the patient does it on his own will and is not stressed to the level where it leads to exhaustion. So this test has to continue till the patient says, I cannot do it anymore. And that's the point where you need to see the system that is it the lungs ventilatory problem? Is it the cardiac problem? Is it the circulatory problem? Or finally, is it the problem at the level of the muscle or the mitochondria, which are probably required, which are required for the muscular contraction or the exercise to go on? So this is a simple picture which just tries to tell you the oxygen concentrations, the carbon dioxide concentrations, and the volume of flow during inspiration and expiration. You can see hardly any carbon dioxide. Uh, you can see that with every breath, you will get the oxygen in, you'll get the carbon dioxide out, and then the litters which are moving in. So tidal volume breathing, we know that the volume, but now exactly we will be looking for the amount of volume which has moved in and the amount of oxygen in concentration which has gone inside, and of course the one which has come out, and also the carbon dioxide. The test used to initially require where you need to collect the entire gas for the 10 minutes. So you can imagine the amount of bags which are required and those bags keep on filling and it ultimately fills the entire room. But now we have online analyzers. So if you have an online analyzer, you can constantly sample breath by breath the amount of oxygen, the amount of carbon dioxide and the amount of air being moved per second. But there are other measurements which are also done in the CPAT, which are just uh, ancillary one to make the uh, understanding of the various organs to their level of limitation more easy. So we give a work to the patient to perform, which can be either be done on the bicycle or the treadmill. We have discussed that last time. And we look at the maximum oxygen uptake, which is VO2 max. And obviously the maximum amount of carbon dioxide, which has come out, which is VO VCO2. And we also have monitors like heart rate, ECG, BP, saturation. And we also do the other calculations which are required, like calculation of the anaerobic threshold. Anaerobic threshold, we have already discussed, is the point where the muscle turns from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism because the oxygen supply is outstretched at that point of time and there is no more glucose available. So it tries to shift into an anaerobic metabolism where lactic acid is being produced, which will lead to increase in ventilation to take care of that metabolic acidosis, which is occurring, which is the point which is con considered as or called as an inflection point where we calculate the anaerobic threshold. We have discussed that last time. Also. You can do direct ABG measurements, serum lactate measurements, but they are most of the times not required. And very importantly, we use Borg scales or the modified Borg scales, which I showed you last time, to rate the, uh, uh, the amount of difficulty which the patient has in performing the test, uh, which is uh, progressively worsening. So is it the, the dyspnea and the leg fatigue, they need to be scored. And they need to be scored till the patient says, I can't do anything more, where he will say perhaps the dyspnea is so much he cannot do it, or maybe it's his legs which are going to give away if he tries to do any more exercise. So all these parameters which are being there, they are trying to correlate with the patient's effort. And this effort must go on till it is limited by the patient. And that is the point where patient will say, I cannot do anything more. So that's very important that sub maximal exercise test being performed on CPAD is not good enough for interpretation to find out what is the cause of dyspnea in the patient because it did not go up to the maximal limit. So the first point we always start looking forward when we look at the CPAD results is has the patient performed the test up to the level of so called as limitation or exhaustion or not. Clinically, of course, we see and also ask the patient and many times the patient says that it's their leg which is hurting or they're too breathless or they are completely exhausted and sweating, which you can see clinically also. Deepak, All can I this, something? Yeah, sure. Quickly. So last slide. So quickly. So there's lots of parameters for someone in the previous slide. So there's a lot of parameters there for someone who's starting CPET. What do you think the focus should be on? What are the basic minimum? We'll come back to this later on too, I know. But what are the basic minimum parameters you need to look at when you're starting off with CPEG? So uh, now the, the question is, you know, when you are asking for an exercise test in which you want to see whether the patient has got exercise limitation or not. And exercise is directly related to the VO2. So if VO2 is the first parameter which you need to see, 
and i am going to come to that that you need to achieve more than 83% or 85% sure. whatever the parameter you take and if you have able to achieve that then obviously if, if if most likely you do not have any cause of dyspnea and whatever it is there it could be something not related to the entire system of uh, uh, of the entire systems which we have seen which include respiratory cardiac circulatory and the muscular symptoms right friend so i think this is a little tough thing these are called wasserman graphs they are standard this is nine panels 1 2 3 2 9 they are standardized panels and they are very significant for reporting and for interpretation of the cpat because each panel is trying to tell you some information about an individual component of the exercise testing we'll come a little later because they are all jumbled up here but this is how the report is going to come the report will come this much in color and also this much of cramped nine panels on one page so obviously you need to look at little more carefully for them so we will go to panel one by one and try to find out what these panels are individually trying to tell us and then we will come to something like you know how to analyze them and go from step 1 to step 2 to step 3 and step 4 which are the four essential uh, tests for reporting the c Once you have got already the results. The test modality to begin with is that uh, we want to find out that what is the limiting factor that the patient is not or the person is not able to perform his exercise. So why is he dyspneic on exertion? This that's the question which needs to be addressed by CPAT. And as I have stressed already enough, that you need to stress the cardiorespiratory system to such a level where it identifies that what is limiting the exercise. Is it lungs giving away? is it the heart giving away is it the circulation which is going out of control or is it finally the muscle which is not able to perform so at that point of termination of the test you need to identify these four distinct uh, four dist uh, distinct systems to find out which was the system which stressed was which was stressed out of proportion where it could have never have gone any further and of course is the is the reason for limiting the exercise capacity in an individual patient and i think raja very rightly asked you know what do you need to start to look at it so peak vo2 maximal oxygen uptake because when you need to do exercise you need to take oxygen and the amount of exercise you do is related to amount of oxygen which reaches there so the oxygen uptake is the primary marker of the exercise capacity and that's the first parameter which we look at it and second is where this ex, uh, the, the entire exercise shifts from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism which is the point of anaerobic threshold these are the things which are very important and obviously we'll come to it later on but we do cpat not only for looking at vo2 also also to look at the exercise capacity but we look at for the level of disability so in in a lot of situations you you need to see that uh, if the vo2 is like less than 40% of the uptake the patient is really exercise limited and this is a disability quality certificate for that person identifying the cause of dyspnea which is causing limitation of exercise is a most common indication in pulmonologist practice you need to screen the patients when you have them with obviously a ventilatory diseases like copd or ild for other causes of dyspnea which could be worsening the patient's symptoms rather than just our respiratory disease so coexistent diseases like ischemic heart disease peripheral vascular disease pulmonary hypertension or arterial hypoxemia all of them can be there and you need to identify them that how important they were in limiting the patient's exercise test also it helps us to uh, plan the patients for the rehabilitation exercise training as to what what level of exercise training to start with and how to build on it and also to look at if there is any effect of the interventions which could be various in the respiratory field and finally it is also of importance from prognostic significance as we discussed last time that surgical risk in fact surgical risk is an important point to be calculated for patients who are undergoing for pneumonectomy or lobectomy with borderline risk respiratory reserve where a vo2 uh, max of uh, somewhere around 14 ml per minute per kg is considered as an adequate one which is a good enough value to go ahead with a pneumonectomy in such situations and of course many other aspect of information can be achieved from the cpat there are few contraindications acute myocardial which is quite obvious acute myocardial infarction unstable angina unstable arrhythmias patients with acute endocarditis patients who develops uh, syncope or very severe symptomatic aortic stenosis uncontrolled heart failure acute pulmonary embolism patients in severe respiratory failure 
and of course patients who are on oxygen cannot also be put on to the cpat test uh there could be many other reasons but by and large the cardiac reasons are the most important reasons where there are absolute contraindications and unstable patients cannot be put on to cpat so once we start this exercise test we determine that you know this individual who has come with this age with this height this weight and this race how much exercise capacity he is supposed to do and this is according to the normograms we use the same normograms which are used in the west we predict that this patient should be able to perform about 100 watts 200 watts or 300 watts so depending upon whatever it can be like you know, the intermediate figures 140 160 but we calculate according to his age weight and height and race and sex that this is the amount of exercise which needs to be done the second point is that this exercise needs to be performed in 10 minutes the cardio pulmonary exercise test the duration of the test is 10 minutes so if you decide that this patient has to do 100 watts you will use 10 minutes every minute rise so that by the end of 10 minutes you reach 100 watts on the other hand there are young and healthy people who might be actually required to do 200 watts so in those patients we need to or those people we would like to raise 20 watts every minute so that we are able to achieve 200 watts at the end of 10 minutes the important point to remember is the protocol requires the cpat to be done in 10 minutes because that's the time which is comfortable for the patient to perform the exercise once you extend it beyond that most of the people are not able to do and the results go haywire so that's why it is a standardized 10 minutes now the exercise test can be given to them in two ways either the incremental or the continuous so why i told you incremental is because every minute you keep increasing them till you reach the maximum and you need to reach that by 10 minutes followed that is a recovery period on the other hand you can have a continuous one in which you can put the patient straight away onto one amount of work and then let it continue for a full 10 minutes till the time the patient comes to an exhaustion so these continuous tests are less used morely more commonly we are using incremental test in the laboratory and these are more easy to standardize as well as the results match very closely because if you look at the vo2 uptake it just parallels the the workload increase so w increase versus vo2 increase is almost parallel running so it gives a very good idea as to how the oxygen uptake is going as the exercise is proceeding in an individual patient what is his efficiency and if this slopes change then they always indicate that this patient has a issues in the exercise capacity which is primarily either the oxygen delivery or it is the oxygen utilization which all will be reflected on the vo2 peak so this is how it is being done you can see that you can use either bicycle can see the treadmill the idea of using ergometers cycle ergometers mostly in the laboratories are because they are cheaper they are safer you don't uh, uh, it's not scary to see that the patient falls off the treadmill uh, while they are trying to cope up with that so less dangerous it is and of course very direct power calculation 10 watts how much vo2 so we know that the slope is per watt so it is very easy to calculate if you go on a treadmill you need to do it on mets so you need to transfer it into uh, watts then only you will be able to make a direct comparison so a lot of cal calculation is required when you do a treadmill test in fact uh, in the cycle ergometer this is very simple because all the parameters come in direct relationship with what how much exercise you have done in fact the first part of the exercise test is that he has done an adequate exercise or not and if he cannot do it then you start finding it that what was the reason why he could not do it so it's very simple to do it on a cycle ergometer very little training required most of the people are able to do but i think there were a lot of questions last time regarding patients who have got bilateral osteoarthritis total knee replacements who cannot be able to perform the or sit on the bicycle and such people are generally put on to the treadmill and in treadmill we get a little higher vo2 it's more functional because patients walk on it it is good for giving them even oxygen prescription and sometimes patients may find it more familiar however in the indian studies which we also published is that indian patients are somehow more happy on a cycle ergometer rather than on treadmill because they have been learning about cycling right from their early childhood and this is something which we have they have learnt already so unless and until there are orthopedic uh, restrictions most of the patients are happy on cycle ergometer and so are the physicians because of easy uh, interpretation of these tests so that brings us to first question and now to raja 
sorry Deepak, before I go to the question, um, in the previous slide, suppose there's a physician who had has access to both, so has access to a bicycle ergometer, has access to a treadmill, what would your carry home message be? Would you use different sets of patients for both? Would you just go with the bicycle ergometer? How would you choose? Right. I think very good question, Raja. Like we also have on one side cycle and one side treadmill and the center, the CPAT. So we use uh, cycle as far as possible unless and until the patient says he cannot perform it. And uh, they are the patients who are not ready to sit on the cycle because either because of their back problems or they are because of their knee problems. So most of the times that is the issue. The second thing where you would like to use is in where you seriously consider that the cardiac issues are going to come and you are going to monitor them more better on a, on a treadmill. Although on a cycle ergometer, it is the same uh, stress test which is going on with the ECG recordings, but they are more amenable to, uh, you know, the, the, the tuning with the cardiac uh, point of view is more on a, a treadmill. So if a patient is purely being looked after from a treadmill perspective, uh, from a cardiac point of view, then perhaps a treadmill is better, but most of the times we'll go for a cycle ergometer. Right. Wonderful. So audience, now is your chance. So what we do is, like you've done in the previous um, modules, we'll give you a question with four answers. I will be able to see what answers you've given uh, in the form of a poll. And then between myself and Deepak, we'll discuss your answers and a little bit of evidence about based on which we'll try and give you the answer. So the first question, which you can see in front of you, which exercise modality is least likely to yield exercise desaturation in COPD. So least likely being operational. Is it treadmill? Is it timed walking test? Is it a cycle ergometer? Or do you think it's all the same irrespective of what you use? And your time starts now. So while we are waiting, we heard Dr. Talwar saying a little while ago about the fact that with treadmill you attain a higher VO2 max. So that's something maybe to keep in mind when you're trying to answer this question. You also heard the comfort of the Indian patients with a cycle ergometer. So least likely to yield exercise desaturation. Um, I think that's also important from the perspective of our respiratory patients because some of them are going to desaturate very badly. Sure, sure. So. Interesting answer, Deepak. So about 50% of people have said that a timed walking test is the choice which is least likely to yield exercise desaturation in COPD. And then there's about 12 odd percent who've said treadmill. There's about 18% who've said ergomet cycle ergometer. And then a good one fifth have said that it does not matter. They're all exactly the same as far as exercise desaturation is concerned. So 50% time walking test. What's your take, Deepa? So Raja, I think you had initially also asked about it. You know, when do you choose on a treadmill versus a cycle ergometer? There was, I think you were giving a hint that if the patient is very hypoxic, uh, uh, likely to become very hypoxic during the exercise testing, you would rather avoid them to put on to where you can achieve more. That is, that is the treadmill. So I think you had given that. They're not all the same. Definitely, uh, there is a difference in that. And we do see in, in such a situation that uh, we find uh, the treadmill leads to a little more desaturation. But it ultimately depends upon the pathology, which is the underlying cause for it. So if they have a gas exchange abnormality, it will be more profoundly coming out on a treadmill test. Otherwise, if it is a simple desaturation, which is like 4% to 5%, it can be very easily picked up on a cycle ergometer also. Only thing is you need to know that if you change one uh, modality to the second modality between two cycle ex uh, two exercise testing, then they cannot be comparable if the, if the device was uh, or the modality was different. And you can see this actually, it is trying to show you that the VO2 is uh, when you go uh, continuously on a load, they're almost parallel to each other, irrespective of how you set in. So like whether you give it to somewhere around five watts per minute, whether you go to 10 watts per minute, whether you go to 20 watts per minute, it always the relationship between the VO2 and the load is maintained with the slopes being close to each other. So 
the only thing is that the achieving the predicted watt is actually indicative of the normal capacity so you need to see that you should be able to achieve it in 10 minutes so very important to see that the exercise capacity has to be calculated and then you have to set your cycle it's not that a routine like 10 watts per minute can go for every patient it may go good for patients who are 50 years and above and who have some disease but in people who are like 40 years younger people where the expected load is like 200 watts so if you put them 10 watts per minute they will finish the exercise very well but it is not a maximal exercise test it will be a sub maximal exercise test So this is the ERS uh, long back in 2007, you know, to uh, the indices. I think which again uh, Raja has asked very specifically, what are the important indices? So VO2 peak, as we discussed, is decreased in across everything. So that's the first parameter which will show you that there is an exercise limitation. And then you start working on anaerobic threshold, so, uh, arterial desaturation, and obviously you also look at the slopes, which we are going to discuss little later. So that brings so us to question two. So Deepa, I've got another question before we go to this one. So in the previous question, it talks about heart failure as a cause of crossing the anaerobic threshold. So there's a plus for heart failure, whereas there isn't isn't one for airways disease, interstitial lung disease, etc. So is that specific for heart disease that your anaerobic threshold comes earlier, or how do you interpret that particular chart? okay so uh, they are coming in subsequent slides also raja but the issue is the anaerobic threshold means that uh, the blood has outstripped the exercise so we think that heart failure is a very important cause of it because it won't be able to push the blood flow so after the exercise the 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 the, the failing heart will not be able to provide the bl blood flow to the muscle and levels will fall down and it will shift to anaerobic metabolism early so anaerobic threshold comes early which is less than 40% of your exercise capacity in patients with heart failure that is one of the things but second also important reason is the patients who have got muscular diseases even in them you won't be able to get an early uh, uh, early uh, you will also get an early anaerobic threshold like mitochondrial diseases so diseases of the muscle per se which cannot extract oxygen so they will also get a similar kind of pattern sure grand so thank you people so coming to the next poll question so the question is the slope of the relationship between oxygen uptake and work rate for an incremental exercise test and then your choices are is increased following endurance training is decreased following endurance training can be normal in obese individuals and fourth is typically greater than normal in patients with coronary artery disease the time starts now um i don't think that this should be a big challenge you heard dr talwar talking about this a minute ago and i'm sure he's going to show us some evidence as we go along as to the relationship between vo2 uptake and the slope so when you look at the vo2 uptake you look at its value and also look at the slope so there are two things which are possible there to look at it so vo2 maximum of course is the amount which is going to tell us whether the person is able to perform the exercise or not to the maximum but the slope tells you how the process of exercise has gone through so can it be improved or can it be different in other diseases so that's i think the whole idea of this question sure sure so deepak about a majority a vast majority actually say a which is increased following endurance training then there's about a fourth so about 27% who say is decreased following endurance training and then we have got a little bit of the rest people generally don't feel can be normal in obese individuals and then there's a 10% which say typically greater than normal in patients with coronary artery disease so your comment about a and b deep okay so i think it's very important for us to understand that the slope cannot change even with training so slope remains the same only if you are a very good athlete you will be able to increase your vo2 max to a very high level so that's what the training you are going to do as far as the slope that's a constant relationship and in fact it only fails when patients who have got heart failure or cardiac disease so in fact the slope changes whenever there is a circulatory changes and that is primarily cardiac disease and in obesity it is just shifted but remains parallel so the slope doesn't change even in obesity so when there is a morbid obesity when we do the cpat we correct the vo2 to the per kg of body weight of an individual and then we find that the slope comes out to be the same 
which is required for that like like whatever we are talking about it is supposed to be 10 ml so it remains the 10 ml if we correct it with the obesity and the slope will not change so what we change with the exercise and the trainings and everything is primarily the value of the vo2 max which we are able to achieve so what we say that this is vo2 max for an individual that's true but that also depends whether he's sedentary whether he is a average healthy individual or he is a really very well trained athlete so very well trained athletes can increase their vo2 max to almost about 25 to 50% that's what the training matters actually or training does to these patients coronary artery disease or cardiac diseases this change the slope like we are showing here you are able to reach and get some vo2 peak but then it goes very slowly because the blood supply by the cardiac system the circulatory system is slow so it is gone oxygen is reaching there they are able to perform exercise but not at the level or at the at the rather the slope which it is supposed to do so that's why it's not only the value but also the slope needs to be identified and that brings me to one point that uh, there is a confusion about vo2 max and vo2 peak so these are the terms which are intuitively used but what we need to understand is vo2 max is predicted so this individual this height this weight this sex this uh, race is expected this much of vo2 max that is predicted normograms that's what we do not have for india so we are still using the western standards only i have true but uh, that is the max which is predicted the other important point is that when patient he may not actually achieve that 100% he might stop short at 90 80 70 whatever it is whatever he achieves maximum is called vo2 peak it is not reached the max but it is the vo2 peak for an individual person since performing actually test we even do not know whether it is actually a normal variation for him or he is the one who is supposed to achieve much more than that had it been uh, earlier or after the intervention it will change we do not know so the difference between these two terminologies is what is he is expected to do and what he is actually achieved so whatever you achieve maximum vo2 is a peak it, if it is close to max then fine but if it doesn't there will be a gap left behind between the two and that will be the gap which is which has to be not more than 17% or 15% which is the acceptable uh, standards for interpretation of the vo2 peak this is vo2 max and that brings us to the third question raja yeah sure so third question vo2 peak of more than 85% rules out any exercise limitation is that true or false you can see dr talwar smiling there so that's always when there's a trick question so true or false a and b and then i don't know is the third choice so i know you're going to speak about this deepak in a few minutes you'll talk about the 85% i'm just looking for the results so 60% of people say that it's true that vo2 peak of more than 85% rules out an exercise limitation but there's a good 40% who say that it's false and so no i don't know, know. <laughs> so i think both of bo both the choices are correct people are very right because what is happening here is that we are predicting that this person has this much so patient might be having actually earlier much more than that and it has decreased now since he on the test before so we do not have exact idea but by and large yes if you have achieved 85% practically it means to to us is that there is no exercise limitation but there is only one caveat there and that caveat is that for an individual person we do not know whether this 85% was really 85% or not because 110% of his peak before or max was 110% then obviously coming to 85 itself is a decreased exercise capacity so like what it tries to tell you is this question that if you get that uh, vo2 is achieved is actually 85% and patient still complains of dyspnea there might be a mild disease which is going to be overlooked considering that we do know that patient had an originally how much of vo2 before he had exercise induced uh, dyspnea or whatever were his complaints coming up at that point of time but this is very uncommon because most of the times when we get the patients they are already limited to much below 85 where the things are more clearer it's only in the line cases 
but by and large the first step for interpretation is whether the patient has achieved vo2 max or vo2 peak of his in up to 85% or not is it more than 85 or not so some people take 83 more than 83 somebody take 85 so it's basically 84 to 85 so if he has achieved that then obviously a significant disease is ruled out you know there could be anxiety there could be very very early bile disease and perhaps you would like to repeat the test in 6 months time or something like that so the Deepak, degree of impairment about, sorry Deepak. so when you talk about a comparison would that not be true more for athletes where you're assessing performance rather than for normal that, individuals who are going to exercise isn't it that's very correct very correct raja you have picked it up uh, and pointed out very rightly that it is of more importance particularly to the athletes who are undergoing training and of course to see the effects of the intervention which you are doing it should sure. be any intervention but that will be on a longitudinal basis the more idea as to which way the things are going in this situation you are very right so severe is less than 40% so if your vo2 peak is less than 40% of predicted that is considered as severely impaired people and these are the people which are considered as handicapped in the west and given uh, all the uh, privileges which are given being for the handicapped people they are also very uh, important also a very important parameter for compensation purposes which are occupational or non occupational depending upon how much your vo2 um, because of whatever you have done in the in the occupational environment so this uh, as i said you know this uh, uh, parameter is generally considered 83% for both men and women but it can be higher uh, it can be kept just 80% in people who are more than 70 years of age and of course extreme body dimensions are also very important people who are very thin or very obese then again the values will be different and you need to interpret according to the weight per kg of that person vo2 per kg vo2 ml per kg you need to so as i said you know it is like these are the only two conundrums which are there sometimes we we might not be getting the vo2 peak in isolation coming up for the reporting of a decrease in exercise capacity and that brings us to the fourth question raja because vo2 peak is the first test report which you need to see as i said sure so we now come to something that uh, dr talwar has actually alluded about a few times and we'll go into some details about this i know so increase in ventilation in response to exercise below the lactate threshold is typical typically a linear function of is it increase in tidal volume is it increase in pulmonary co2 output is it an increase in pulmonary oxygen uptake or is it in the increase in breathing frequency so those are your four choices go for it so when we are talking about lactate threshold we are talking about the anaerobic threshold is it in deeper yeah so we are talking the anaerobic threshold and lactate threshold and uh, ventilatory threshold are the three terminologies which are interchangeably used in the exercise test we discussed it last time and i think right. uh, this question is primarily again trying to remind that you know what drives the respiration so is so that is why i think in last lecture also we discussed how you need to increase your ventilation you increase your tidal volume you increase your respiratory rate but in response to what is it to which is the most important thing which drives the ventilation so sure. that's why this point has come up here so we got a split house deepak so there's 50% of people who think that it's related to increase in tidal volume and this 50% who think it's related to increase in breathing frequency <laughs> so i think uh, there's a confusion about response to sure. exercise yeah. what is the what is the basically the relationship with the exercise so these are the two different things response and the relation so i think everybody what's they are trying to tell us is that uh, we are looking at increase in ventilation by increase in tidal volume and respiratory rate both we discussed last time that respiratory rate can go up to 50 and tidal volume can reach almost 60 to 70% of their vital capacity and that's the maximum you can reach and after that it becomes so uncomfortable with the respiratory system that it cannot go further so there is a lot of respiratory reserve always left at the end of the exercise in normal people because that is impossible to achieve and get into that much of tidal volume at that much of respiratory rate 
but what closely goes with the ventilation is actually the co2 co2 is the one which determines a linear relationship between the exercise versus the ventilatory system and the moment anaerobic threshold comes the the, the increased carbon dioxide produced just upsets this linearity and change that linearity and the importance is to change that linearity point to find out where is the anaerobic threshold happened so this is exactly the principle of finding out what is the at so we can't keep on uh, you know uh, we can't put in a iv cannula and do the serum lactate levels continuously it's not possible so we need to have a surrogate marker to identify what, where is the lact anaerobic threshold has come so as i i think we started from the beginning that you look at the amount of exercise individual has done the maximum oxygen uptake which has gone and then whether the anaerobic threshold could be achieved or not the patient did the exercise at the point where the change from aerobic to anaerobic happens whether it happened or not in an individual so to identify this is the important thing because what upsets the balance is the co2 so the moment the vco2 increases suddenly that is in response to washout excess carbon dioxide which is happening primarily because this now anaerobic metabolism produce more carbon dioxide than the oxidative metabolism we know this is the time where you need to identify this on a graph that this is where the anaerobic threshold is happening uh, if the patient prematurely stops the exercise it will never achieve this is very typical in respiratory patients so they have any respiratory reserve, uh, reserve so by the end this is 3 to 4 minutes of exercise they have not even completed their aerobic metabolism this this point of at comes this stops the exercise so many a times we come up with the exercise test in which there is no anaerobic threshold to identify what was the reason why the anaerobic threshold didn't come in this an individual and most of the times these are patients either didn't coordinate they were poor uh, uh, coordination to do the test they were not willing to carry on with the terminated prematurely or there are patients who are ventilatory reserve which can be easily seen by the ventilatory parameters in so this is typically you can see the lactate threshold what is happening is that suddenly the lactate starts going up this is you can see around 80% of the vo2 max so normal people get about 80 to 85% but it's a huge starting from here so in fact very difficult to identify a point where it suddenly turns so what we do is what is called a area it's called a zone so anaerobic threshold is more or less it is considered as a zone so you pick up a zone and try to see the lowest part of the zone being less than 40 or not if it goes below below 40% that is where it was not expected to happen so there is somewhere there was a blood supply could not reach the muscle and they had to shift their metabolism from aerobic to anaerobic early so that is what we need to identify by looking at the anaerobic threshold but as i said we don't do the lactate level so what we try to look at this what is the sudden change in the vo2 and vco2 so this is something which you can see this is the the time and use time work thing because they are going by a continuous same thing as is every one minute the work is also increasing so in this axis you can see there is a time going on or it can be even work doesn't matter but the two curves are seen the red and the blue ones red and the blue ones so you what you can see is one is the o2 and another is the co2 they are going together they are going and chasing each other closely and suddenly the red one which is the co2 you can see it crosses the blue line the oxygen one and goes above that so that means now the carbon dioxide production is more than the oxygen which is getting inside so this is the point which is the anaerobic threshold you can identify but these graphs sometimes don't typically show us so the change which is happening here which is exactly the point where it has crossed lactate is a different because lactate will have buffers in the blood and by the time you see the lactate rising there would be certain period of time in which the blood would have actually tried to dilute the effect of lactate but increase in co2 is something which is happening immediately as soon as you find there is some amount of acidosis coming into the blood so this is one of the graphs which you can use to identify and uh, that brings us to not anaerobic threshold so i think vo2 watt and then anaerobic threshold so raja that is why this question has come at this level sure so i'll read that question and this audience question which i think is relevant and i'll ask you that while we're waiting for the answer deep so the question in front of you anaerobic threshold it's a zone rather than an accurate point 
Second choice, it's normally at 85% of the VO2 peak. Third, it's easy to be localized on a VO2 graph. And fourth, it may not be seen in healthy athletes. So those are your four choices. And while we are waiting, Deepak, quick question. There's Dr. Shahistra Buddhe who says that on a bicycle ergometer, it's very difficult to achieve a VO2 max. So we've been talking about what modality to use, whether it's a treadmill, a bicycle ergometer, and so on. So what's your comment on that? He feels that getting a bicycle ergometer to achieve VO2 max is a challenge. Well, uh, yeah, 100% is if you want to see that uh, VO2 peak becomes VO2 max in an individual very rarely happens. Very true. That is true. So, but by and large, they are able to achieve 85%, 90%. It does happen. If they are not able to do, it is because of the poor effort of the patient that we will be able to identify in this. So that that, that is still considered as a choice to perform this because we are not achieving 100%. What we are trying to achieve is whether we are able to achieve sure. or not. Sure. So Deepak, the audience has been listening to you carefully. So they've gone for choice A, which is it's a zone rather than an accurate point. That's about 65% of people. About 25% have gone for point C, which says it's easy to be localized on a VO2 uh, graph. And then there's minuscule numbers for the remaining B and D on there. Yeah, so I think zone and 85% were the two clear in the last couple of slides very clearly. So you can see that actually the 80, it's, it's, it's basically not single value which is coming onto it but the rule of thumb is that it needs to be above 40 percent so if it's less than 40 percent then obviously we consider it that the anaerobic threshold occurred too early so you need to find out why it occurred too early because then the patient is not able to perform the exercise because it's a very painful to carry on the exercise once the anaerobic threshold has come you might be able to do not more than that so after the anaerobic threshold the amount of exercise is very less maximum part of the exercise is prior to the 80 level which comes and of course in older people and uh, elderly people it may come even at a later stage but that is okay this is another method like ventilation what happens to ventilation so Ventilation increases with the with the uh, with the exercise. So if you have more carbon dioxide produced in the body because of pressure coming in, then you need to do more uh, increase your ventilation more. So ventilation curve also suddenly increases, and that is also can be identified on a V slope. So these are all basically where the slope suddenly shifts. So whether it is occurring on VO2, VCO2 slope, occurring on a VE slope, so you can actually do this. The important thing is most of the times the machines will try to look at it by the figures and other things and put a line there. But this line is according to them. So many times actually we do and uh, do manual things rather than going by the oil valve for looking at the anaerobic thresholds. So the best fit lines can change whether it is done by machine or it is done by you. But when we see the results, we can easily change it and it is editable on the, on the machines that you can edit it and then make these lines and see that, okay, I feel this line is better. Cut off of this V, v slope is coming at the level which might actually change the anaerobic threshold. So clarity of this varies. Uh, and uh, obviously it is not very clear in patients who are on beta blockers, very elderly people or people who have got dilated cardiomyopathy. So the healthy people will be able to identify where is the anaerobic threshold. In the training, what they are trying to do is they are trying to push their anaerobic threshold to as far away at the end of the exercise as possible. So those who are marathon runners, that's their business as far as possible, maintaining the exercise to a level where it is kept as far away as possible so that they can perform the marathon activity in which to go. There are other slopes also which you can see like uh, I think all the values are given. The zone is being many times what happening is the levels are coming very slowly changing. So you cannot actually pinpoint. So in that case, what is important for us is that the zone has occurred. So that means the change has occurred, but we might not be able to pinpoint it. So 10% there, 10% there, that's okay. So that's why we identify it as zone. And generally, that's why the figure also, some people want to say 35%, some say 40%, some say 45%. But by and large, accepted by the standards, uh, by all the, uh, all the CPAT labs is that 40%. You should be able to achieve 40% for them. 
so <clears throat> then we go to ventilatory equivalents so this is a little tough thing we discussed last time also. so what it means is that to remove 1 liter of oxygen or 1 liter of carbon dioxide how much of ventilation is required so this is basically indicators of how efficient your ventilation is so if the uh, ventilation is not efficient that means that there is something wrong which is happening in change of gases so that is why this is considered as a parameter of gas exchange so it is a parameter which will try to pick up that something wrong is happening at the gas exchange level and it is also seen in hyperventilation because if you wash out too much of carbon dioxide by increasing your ventilation out of proportion to what is happening to the oxygen then that that is perhaps if it is not explained by gas exchange in an individual which we will have other parameters also to look at if you get only one single parameter that co2 is getting washed out much more with a more of ventilation required for the patient then there is a hyperventilation syndrome which is related to anxiety which can be picked up in the in the cpat curves and very important at these points but you are seeing there are minor fluctuations here if it's a hyperventilation syndrome we find huge chaotic kind of curves of ventilatory threshold which come which gives us an idea that the patient is changing ventilation too fast and the co2 is changing in record to that ventilation which is happening which is primarily anxiety induced so we can pick up those kind of things on these kind of graphs and this is a value which is generally taken at 80 so generally you need to be on the co2 less than 30 so if you are having more than 30 that means you have more carbon dioxide to handle so obviously if you have more carbon dioxide to handle that means there is a some gas exchange abnormality which is happening because co2 is primarily responsible for the gas exchange there and then obviously end tidal oxygen and end tidal carbon dioxide we know that we are looking at alveolar one and which is coming at the mouth level so we can actually look at it but if arterial also arterial gases can be done but we hardly ever use arterial gases so normally there is increase in oxygen at the end and decrease in carbon dioxide but if there are changes here that again shows that there is a gas exchange abnormality which is coming up which we'll discuss in a little later one and this is a little composite picture which is trying to tell you what happens at the lactic threshold so you can see that ventilation suddenly increases vco2 suddenly increases o2 is trying to match but then the vco2 has outstripped now so ventilatory equivalents you can see that they are they are not changing at the anaerobic threshold but they just change their directions because now there will be more efficient ventilation if present will try to manage and cope up with the ventilatory thresholds there the carbon dioxide falls the oxygen increases and then lactate levels bicarbonate levels and ph levels if you are able to maintain the abgs then you can do so these are physiological responses which are occurring at the at level and this is also very important to analyze with the exercise test many a time precise location is not possible we have discussed and there are certain clinical indicators also like if the patient is profusely sweating that means there is a lot of catecholamine release there is increase in systolic pressure and this patient is really showing exhaustion which shows that probably the if it reach the anaerobic threshold already because this is primarily because of increase in catecholamines so these are generally considered as more of a exercise training for athletes where it is difficult to identify the anaerobic threshold very clearly so if it is not identifiable as we discussed before also able to see it at all so it is either the patient has terminated the exercise prior to that which could be either the patient failing to perform the exercise like what is called as poor effort it it could also be because of the obstructive lung disease respiratory reserves have uh, already declared that they cannot carry on with the exercise any further so aerobic metabolism and the exercise ends there but it also is a very important as i think raja has said right in the beginning the cardiac causes dilated cardiomyopathy heart failure patients patients on beta blockers it it's again the reason where it may not be easily identified or it has come too early in elderly and obese people again it is a challenge to identify them but if you are not able to identify you can look at the values where the pco2 suddenly uh, sorry the vco2 suddenly starts increasing so breath by breath when you are looking at the chart actually you get every 10 second records coming up so that will also tell you that how the vco2 has suddenly which was coming to like 600 650 610 20 30 it was increasing regularly and suddenly it takes a jump of 50 so that itself shows that this this has happened actually finally so you can use other methods uh, to identify whether the anaerobic threshold is there 
or not. If it's truly not there, then you need to find out why it did not happen in an individual patient. And patients are very common not to achieve anaerobic threshold at all. That brings us to the, the first part of it, that whether the test was exercise, maximal exercise test or not. So as I said in the beginning, exercise to the limit where you say that you cannot do anything more than that. So how can we tell that? That most of the times the tests are actually submaximal. That is why they are not interpretable. You need to make the patient suffer, that is right. But how do you identify that? So the identification is primarily looking at RER. So these are, we showed that last time also. We'll again go one by one. But one of the graph is actually the RER. So RER has to achieve, you can see that it goes beyond 1.1. So this is the respiratory exchange ratio. If it was beyond 1.1, that means patient has done his maximal effort. If it is below that, that means the patient has not put in an extra, the complete effort and the anaerobic threshold not coming or coming, uh, not coming or not visualizing at all is probably because the exercise is sub-maximal and it's not a maximal exercise. So that's the caveat. This test requires exercise to be done to maximum. And this is the parameter RER, which is very important. We have discussed aerobic threshold, anaerobic threshold. This is how we go about it. So the panel one graph, which comes is a ventilation versus exercise test. So you can see as the exercise test, the exercise keeps increasing. The ventilation also keeps on increasing. And then it suddenly starts increasing. So if you have two slopes, you can see that there is a V point, which is being on there, which is anaerobic threshold which we have discussed already that this primarily comes because we are looking at the sudden change in ventilation to where it increases much more. And that much more is primarily because it is closely matching CO2. The job of ventilation is not to allow the CO2 to increase. That's the important point. So to mean that it will suddenly increase, you can see it here, that patient did achieve that maximum exercise. And perhaps the last 20% is the done in which the we suddenly increase. So about at 80% patient did achieve his anaerobic threshold where the ventilation increased suddenly. Second graph is oxygen pulse. Last time, I think we spent a lot of time on discussing oxygen pulse. Oxygen pulse is a surrogate marker of stroke work. So this is the this is a beautiful non-invasive method by which you can get an idea of what is happening to the stroke volume when the patient starts exercising. We did discuss that the normal stroke volume is basically the oxygen uh, pulse only have one more factor that is the arteriovenous oxygen extraction. This is basically we have used the fixed principle for that. We have discussed that last time in great details. And uh, uh, oxygen Oxygen pulse, which is like on one side, you can see here, it also increases with the exercise and towards the end only it is going to plateau. So the stroke volume keeps on increasing. We have seen that it increases almost about two to three times, up to four times it can increase with an exercise. And the maximum increase comes from the heart rate. So the heart rate increases much more, but stroke volume also increases and it steadily increases with the exercise. Only patients who are cardiac patients will not be able to achieve this constant increase in the stroke volume and will slow, slowly plateau off. So early plateau of this oxygen, uh, oxygen pulse, which is the indicator of a stroke volume, tells us that patient has a cardiac limitation. So this graph, panel two graph, is very important to identify cardiac limitation. You can see that this is a, there's a, there's a plateau which has almost come towards the end. There's hardly any plateau. But if this graph would have gone like this from here, that would have given us the hint. I'm going to show that a little later. Then the panel three graph is a VO2 peak graph. You can see our VO2 on one side, VO2 on the other side, and you can beautifully see that how the CO2 graph crosses the VO2 graph, which is showing the anaerobic threshold beautifully. So many a times we clearly get the AT level very clearly from this uh, graph, which is uh, trying to look at the anaerobic threshold. And of course, the VO2, VCO2 is matched to the work or the time. You can take anything on the horizontal axis, they are equal. Then we come to the uh, panel four, the second row in which we are now trying to look at the VCO2 as well as the, sorry, VCO2 as well as the, the heart rate. We can see here, there, there's a heart rate graph which is going on and it is increasing. And we know that 
the primary increase in cardiac output is because of increase in the heart rate and also because of the stroke volume but major change occurs in the heart rate so heart rate keeps on increasing till it reaches the heart rate predicted max so this graph which is uh, again trying to match up we can again see that uh, vco2 is there again on this and wherever the vco2 is there it can be also looked at the uh, 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 determination now once you reach the heart rate predicted maximum that is age minus uh, sorry 220 minus age that's the general formula which we use we don't expect any heart rate reserve to be left so if there is a significant heart rate reserve which could be like 5 or 10 or 15 beats in an individual patient it happens in patients who have respiratory diseases patients who have put in their poor effort patients who are deconditioned or patients who are already on drugs like beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. So it's very essential for a CPAT test to see if the patients are on beta blockers or calcium channel or not. Otherwise, they will be led to what is called as a chronotropic uh, incompetence. In Second important thing is the slope. Slope is also very important. If this slope, rather than going this, goes straight up, it shows that there is an acute response on heart rate with increase in exercise. So what it means is stroke volume didn't increase. So that is why heart rate had to compensate for increase in cardiac output. And instead of slowly increasing, it just went on and shut immediately up to increase the cardiac output. That also happens in a cardiac output. So same this CO2 heart rate graph, which is panel four, is trying to look into the heart rate reserve, which is there, as well as the slope of the heart rate to panel 5 which is ve over vco2 this i think i said right in the beginning that ve always tries to match the vco2 when vco2 increases then the vo2 also has to increase the same slope which is there and this is again very efficient uh, graph for looking at the uh, gas or again at the cardiac uh, efficiency so these are primarily the gas exchange graphs but can also be affected in cardiac insufficiency, which we are going to discuss later. And then these ventilatory equivalents, how much of oxygen and carbon dioxide per liter of ventilation. So you can see that as you start doing the exercises, there is improvement. So the ventilation becomes more efficient, both for oxygen and carbon dioxide. If there is an anaerobic threshold, which is to be achieved around at the values of 34 to 30, 34 for CO2 and 30 for oxygen. And then after this anaerobic threshold, they start increasing. The oxygen crosses over. Carbon dioxide is they, the, the washout of carbon dioxide excessively keeps on going by increasing the ventilation. So they don't increase much. So you can this typical picture which you get. And this changes also on hyperventilation. So this graph is very important, not only for gas exchange, but also for looking at hyperventilation. So this is a slope about 30 for oxygen and 34 for carbon dioxide. These are the values you can see that. And of course, this slope will change with CO2. When there is a gas exchange abnormality, that is the VDVT. So if the dead space ventilation increases with the exercise, then the slope will also increase. But that's not supposed to happen in normal people. The ventilation perfusion improves with exercise. So the dead space ventilation is supposed to decrease. So if it doesn't happen, this VE over VCO2 will change. And that indicates the gas exchange abnormality. That brings us to tidal volume graph. We have discussed about tidal volume and respiratory rate, both increasing with the increase in ventilation required with the increase in exercise. So how much it increases? So you can see that the tidal volume increases and we discussed last time. It can't approach up to the inspiratory capacity. So it just falls short of the inspiratory capacity. But of course, that the total vital capacity, it reaches almost about 70% of that. That's maximum the tidal volume can increase. So normal tidal volume is about 450 ml. You can go up to maximal about 2.5 liters or 3 liters. Beyond that, you cannot achieve in the tidal volume. But also it will depend upon the type of disease. So in ventilatory disorders, if whether it is obstructive or restrictive, we know that the one disorder will respond more by change in the respiratory rate. That is the interstitial diseases or restrictive disorders. And in obstructive disorders, we will try to increase the tidal volume more. Uh, sorry, we will try to increase the tidal volume more. But then because of the dynamic hyperinflation, it may not increase. So we need to not only look at the tidal volume the minute ventilation, the respiratory rate graphs on the ventilatory limitation, but also to look at the flow volume loops as to whether they are causing limitation or not, which is going to come in one of the later slides. 
breathing reserve everybody has already learned last time everybody was 100% correct that uh, when you are looking at ventilatory limitation you need to look at the breathing deepak i think we lost you for a moment there so if we sort of start off again um, we'll yeah grant thank you can we see again yeah absolutely so i think the there was some issue yeah. so you can see you know there is a huge breathing reserve you can see about 30% of them left so i think i said in the beginning itself you know when you terminate your exercise even in a normal healthy athlete people there will be some amount of breathing reserve left because you cannot use entire uh, your vital capacity and the respiratory rate which is above 50 in an individual patient to sustain the exercise so some breathing reserve will left but if you find that there is no breathing reserve left so that if the patient would have tried to do the exercise the lungs wouldn't have allowed him to do it and that's the respiratory limitation so this graph is very clear to look at it if this dips down to a lower level that is less than 15% or 20% that shows that the breathing reserve was minimal or not there left at all in these situations we know it is a ventilatory limitation so panel 8 is for that and uh, this is this is again trying to tell you the same thing that ventilation can go on but it cannot go on because the patient cannot achieve the maximum voluntary ventilation for more than 12 seconds so that's why we do the test also for 12 seconds we don't do it for even full minute so if you have to perform it for 5 minutes on an exercise test you cannot do it so that's why it's not a limiting factor for a normal human beings so if it is there breathing reserve left it should be left in an individual person if it's not there that is pathological and indicating of ventilatory limitation and the last panel is the uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen end tidal volumes so end tidal concentrations are very important again from the gas exchange point of view so if the co2 is in, in you know after the anaerobic threshold the co2 starts falling because efficient ventilation is trying to push out the carbon dioxide but if it doesn't do that then the co2 doesn't fall down and if the co2 remains high at the at, uh, after the maximal exercise or oh, sorry after the anaerobic threshold to the maximum exercise that shows that there is a gas exchange abnormality which has precipitated by the exercise testing which was not there at the baseline so the, again this is a gas exchange abnormality limitation which we are saying uh, trying to see and the other is about the oxygen so you can see that as you start doing exercise the alveolar oxygen increases and the arterial oxygen falls down and the difference is about 30 so if this difference is more so that means again there is a gas exchange abnormality but more easy to look at the saturations if there is a more than 4% fall in saturation or the saturation at the end of exercise is less than 94% that again shows that there is a gas exchange abnormality which is primarily you need to find out whether it is ventilatory or a pure gas exchange abnormality disorders like pulmonary hypertension end tidal pco2 is a very important parameter is a opportunity to look at the pulmonary gas exchange during the uh, exercise and you can see that this uh, if it increases at the end of the exercise that shows that definitely there is even if there is everything else uh, normal it will indicate that there is a gas exchange abnormality precipitated by extreme of exercise in an individual a very common finding to be seen in patients with pulmonary hypertension only isolated abnormality because most of the time they are considered as a hysterical patient initially so this is the graph you can see all these graphs put together and uh, so we see that the first one is basically looking at the uh, uh, the ve or the oxygen utilization vo2 uptake and then we look at the cardiovascular parameters you can see the cardiovascular parameters then we have ventilatory parameters which, which is the uh, panel number 4 and panel number 7 and again the uh, gas exchange parameters versus ventilatory parameters are all of them in which you can see not only we have the uh, the pet uh, sorry the ventilatory equivalent end tidal oxygen and carbon dioxide graphs we have ve vo vco2 graphs and we also have a heart rate uh, versus vco2 graph so all these panels are trying to tell us some different information so that is why it is considered as the they have been chosen to be kept like that that brings us to if you have all these graphs in your hand and now you want to interpret the report how to go about it 
so these are the four steps and as i said that right in the beginning the step one is to find out whether the test was maximal or not if it is sub maximal test you will write that the test has not been performed to max exercise capacity and hence cannot be interpreted so the test has to be repeated in that case so what is the criteria one of the criteria i told you is the respiratory exchange ratio which to start with is 0.8 we all know that oxygen carbon dioxide ratio 0.8 and it it increases with the exercise to beyond 1.15 uh, generally 1.1 1.15 so if it is like uh, uh, less than 1 or 1 then obviously the exercise test is not good heart rate predicted maximum you need to reach 90% but you go even beyond 90% last time i told you we do not terminate the exercise test just because the predicted heart rate has achieved this happened in treadmill tests in the treadmill cardiologist will achieve that heart rate maximum it has reached 200 they'll stop the test but this is a maximal exercise test so it is not necessary you will see that predicted 180 we have gone up to 210 so heart rate is not a termination criteria unless and until patient comp complains of something related to that if the cardiac arrhythmias are thrown fine if patient complains of chest pain fine but just because he has achieved that heart rate is not a termination criteria but if it is not even 90% then obviously there is something wrong with it that not performed fully Bohr's scale of dyspnea is very important. He must complain that he is very, very dyspneic. So eight by ten is generally considered as a criteria to terminate the test. So patient, whether he has achieved VO2 max or is it the VO2 was still achieving and it is not plateaued at that point of time, that is again needs to be seen. So, but by and large, all of these are the ones which we need to consider. But now, since the spirometry is along with the CPAT and it is called ergo spirometry. so you can also perform a spirometry uh, during the exercise and then see that whether it has got a flow limitation or not and i'm going to show you the graph of that so once the you have done that testing in step 1 that it is adequate and good test performed then you go to the number 2 step which is required to look at the vo2 is it vo2 peak which is acceptable that is up to 85% if it is less than 85% there is exercise limitation and then you come to step 3 to find out what led to this exercise limitation what was the dyspnea why was the dyspnea why was the exercise limited was it respiratory was it cardiac what is uh, pulmonary vasculation what is circulatory what are muscular poor conditioning patient's poor effort all these or anxiety and hyperventilation all these are different set of things which can be diagnosed once you have achieved that level where you need to come to the step 3 and this integration is all done in step 4 because one single parameter will not get the answer that's why there are panels you now start to put the panels together to make the interpretation there so this is the cpat test which is being done i think uh, last time there was a request to show the how the test is been done you can see that there's a monitor which is trying to look into the all the parameters you can see breath by breath uh, analysis is coming so i think raja i said in the you know you can see the vo2 vco2 is breath by breath in sure. there so suddenly they change they tell you so these are the old machine uh, the new machine has ecg and blood pressure and saturations ongoing on the machine itself this is the bicycle ergometer you can see that the patient has been given 54 watts to perform 10 watts are going in 2 minutes up he started doing the exercise non invasive cough is already there this is basically the sensor so this sensor with the mask includes the co2 sensor the o2 sensor and a volume sensor so you will keep getting breath by breath analysis to this sensor only sorry kya koi dikkat mana bhi bhai theek hai aap chalane mein dhyan lagao so this uh, pedaling has to be done at speed of 60 cycles per minute actually uh, per second so sorry per minute so that is the speed which needs to be maintained on the cycle that is equally important so if he does pedaling very slow then he will not be able to achieve his uh, uh, wattage which is required so what is calculated from the speed which is there on the cycling so that is seen on to the monitor of the cycle which is telling us that he is able to do it according to that 50 to 60 uh, which is required so this is the maximal test which i told you 1.1 heart rate maximum which we have already discussed 
and then if the test is done good this is 8 by 10 which i am trying to show you here again that uh, this is the other graph this where you need to be around 17 you need to be on very hard that uh, it has been done and this is done separately for leg fatigue as well as for dyspnea so you need a bog scale to be done for both of them and of course there can be other clinical exhaustion factors like patient profusely sweating but this all is to be achieved in 8 to 12 minutes generally we never go beyond 12 minutes and we do it to the can't do more and this is the vo2 max so you can see that this is the vo2 max you can this the red line you can see it is plateauing at this level only so it has gone parallel to the exercise it kept on increasing and at the end of the exercise it is paralleling there so vo2 peak achieved is more than 83% or 85% depends upon what you want to use is very important and you can see that starting with the 250 ml of vo2 which is 3.5 ml per minute per kg you go almost up to 5 liters at strenuous exercise which is about 70 milliliters uh, per minute per kg an individual so for that instance we are trying to show you one record of the patient where it was 300 ml per minute at rest and it was expected in this individual to reach about 1.6 liters however patient could not only achieve this is about 600 ml that was the maximum which is about 37 percent of the predicted so vo2 37 percent of predicted means it is decreased so exercise capacity is decreased so this is the first thing which we examine from the graph which we get this is the panel three in the wasserman's uh, uh, nine panel graphs there is a linear relationship as i told you not only the vo2 max but the slope the slope needs to be 10 ml of vo2 per minute per watt and you can see this picture which is trying to tell you that the slope is not parallel at all it has just plateaued very easily so this could be either because of the disease heart lung circulation musculoskeletal or even sometimes even a poor effort in an individual so these are the various profile responses i think we have already discussed that they parallel with the uh, work and the PCO2 and the PO2 graphs, they go normally uh, in linear fashion, but cross over at the uh, anaerobic threshold points. Normal slope, then we are trying to upward displacement, which happens in obesity. And then we are trying to show you that uh, uh, with a slope, which is towards the end of it, which is in coronary artery disease and the very low slope, which is like a heart failure slope. And the, we reaches the step three after looking at the test done maximally. VO2 is low. Now we want to find out VO2 max is low or VO2 peak achieved by patient is low due to what? Is it ventilatory? In ventilatory, it is not only the ventilation which is important, but it could be also mechanics. So mechanics is primarily when the tidal volume encroaches upon to the inspiratory capacity in the expiratory limb where the flow limitation occurs, which is, I think, in the next slide will come up. But the ventilatory abnormality is when the breathing reserve is less than 20%. So that means that's the most important thing to identify. If we have the loops coming up with the spirometry, ergospirometer, then we also see that the dynamic hyperinflation progressively increases with the exercise and patient is not able to perform because of the dynamic hyperinflation. The tidal volume plateaus early. The respiratory rate can be achieved about 50. Generally, we consider 50 as maximum. And heart rate peak is not achieved up to the predicted. And there is some amount of heart rate reserve left in ventilatory abnormalities. And if there is a patient who's got a severe respiratory disease, then gas exchange abnormalities will come with it. And gas exchange abnormalities are in the dead space ventilation, that is VDVT ratio. Then there are also things like oxygen level falls down. The difference between the alveolar and the arterial oxygen increases because of more oxygen extraction. And of course, the PCO2 in peak also increases. So the, there, is a, uh, there is an abnormal gas exchange of oxygen, of carbon dioxide, and also of dead space, which are the indicators of gas exchange abnormalities. So you can look at this ventilatory limitation panel, which is trying to tell you here that the, the breathing reserve is calculated from the maximum voluntary ventilation into FEV1 uh, with uh, um, sorry FEV1 multiplied by 35 to 40 whatever you take in your lab and that gives us the MBB. 
so you can see that the tidal volume is increasing the minute ventilation is increasing and how much it encroaches encroaches upon the nvv is the important aspect which we need to see and as we discussed that if it is less than uh, 20% left behind so that means that that uh, reserve was too low to carry on with the exercise and there is a ventilatory limitation and it also comes with the frequency range which we'll see in the graph the next one you can see that this is the tidal volume graph which is being seen this is you can again see that uh, in this graph what we are trying to look at is the the ventilation and it is within the range of various frequencies which are getting and here it is becoming very flat although it is still into the normalcy but still it is becoming much flatter so breathing reserve which is left at the end is very important like in this individual patient we can show you here he started with a with he was expected to have about uh, 28 uh, uh, percent uh, breathing reserve he started with a, at the 55% so obviously he was already ventilating at a high rate at that point of time and terminated the test when there was only about 9% or 8.5% breathing reserve left so this patient who is terminated the test is because of the ventilatory limitation so primarily the cause of dyspnea in this individual will be a ventilatory limitation so these values which are considered as how much of ventilation you can get is also predicted like uh, there are different formulas that generally call, calculate by 85% but by by and large less than 40% ve max over mbv is considered at lt as a ventilatory limitation so this is another one of the parameters besides the ve max minus mbv which is generally about 15 we discussed about it 15 to 20 on the other hand we have another criteria where ve max over mbv is taken at ltt less than 40% so that also we will see in the reports it comes where we see but this is what i was trying to show you is the mechanical ventilation uh, mechanical limitation so you start doing the exercise where the tidal volume curves are small here but because of the dynamic hyperinflation you keep shifting and finally the curve grows and crosses the limitation the so at that point of time even if there is a uh, there is still breathing reserve left but patient will feel breathless because he is encroached upon the flow limitation segment so the we don't don't only look at the ventilatory parameters we also look at the exercise spirometry by showing the dynamic hyperinflation which is shifting the tidal volume curve and finally the bigger tidal volume curves which are coming now by due to increase in uh, exercise are encroaching respiratory limb of the flow volume curve which shows that this is going to be limited because of the it is encroaching onto the area where it will be uncomfortable for the patient to carry on with this and these are the parameters for that but this i think will be a little difficult to understand at the moment but we go on to the second important part which is the cardiac limitation we know that breathing reserve is for the respiratory limitation the two main things which we have discussed but for the cardiac limitation you know generally the breathing reserve will be present because these people are not stopping the exercise because the lungs were bad so they had a breathing reserve left behind however these the oxygen pulse which is very important is less you can see that the achieved you need to go about 80% 85% but the oxygen pulse is less than 70% and again you can see that the slope will change this is the, what i was talking about you can see the slope has come down so even after increasing the exercise the stroke volume that oxygen pulse doesn't increase and it sort of plateauing out so this is again one of the indication or the flattening or the declining of this slope of the oxygen pulse that there is a cardiac limitation happening there and there is also if the heart rate response is not adequate chronotropically what is called as chronotropic incompetence we need to consider that also which happens in patients with cardiac failure as well as patients who are on beta blockers so the cardiac cause of dyspnea is very important seen on this panel of oxygen pulse breathing reserve was for the ventilatory limitation which was on the other side now these are again the things sometimes you know you don't get it clearly you anticipate so two of the curves are which being shown of the patients you can see here as the exercise is increasing the stroke volume that the pulse pulse is increasing and it reaches the peak so that's that's fine but sometimes it flattens so if it flattens like that that is an indicator that perhaps the stroke volume was not increasing 
as it should have increased and you need to evaluate why did it happen so is it probably because of the patient not able to perform because of his cardiac limitation or there is an additional factor which could be even a vascular disease like pulmonary vascular disease there and that brings us to the sixth question what are the indicators i think we go to raja for this i think there was a little uh, cardiac as well as the respiratory we have tried to concisely said that there are certain graphs which needs to be seen breathing reserve for the respiratory and the oxygen pulse that is the stroke volume surrogate marker for the cardiac but for the gas exchange there is much more so raja i think this question is little more difficult but then i think let's sure try. sure we'll also let you get your breath back i actually um my link went for a minute or so so when you were doing the cpet uh, uh, video there's a question i think which is relevant which i'll ask you and then go on to this question so dr R, dr radha munje asks about the fact that lung function test can be done by a technician do you think it's safe to actually allow cpet testing by a technician or do you think a pulmonologist or at least a qualified doctor needs to be there that's one and then how many people have you seen collapsing while doing cpet and whether it's require a necessary requirement to have an intensive care backup when you do something like cpet testing in a hospital like yours or mine i think both questions are very very pertinent and they keep coming often in the talks on cpets so see the the incidence of the cardiovascular collapse in cpet in the western data is somewhere around uh, 0.1% which is very very low but it is mandatory that wherever the cp been performed the cpr full equipment should be available and a physician needs to be present at that point of time having said that we have never seen any collapse in maybe we have we have uh, we are doing cpets from 2007 onwards so it's been many years and i think more than 3000 cpets have been performed but it could also be one of the reason that since we are attached to a cardiac institute most of the patients have already undergone a cardiac evaluation prior to coming for their dyspnea not being corrected at that point of time but i would still say that uh, we have an expert uh, in fact a cardio respiratory therapist to perform it not the technicians at all they are not allowed at all even they are not allowed to do it so they will also do it under a physician and in fact uh, not even a simple mbbs guy we will keep it because initially when we start we always have our senior resident present at that point of time and uh, the important point is when to terminate the test so that's i think if you learn that you won't let it go on to the level where the patient collapses so the questions were very very relevant you need to exercise caution you need to have a physician you need to have an equipment in fact any be not allow you to have a cpet lab without the defibrillator and a full equipment being present in the lab itself but uh, brilliant exposition i mean i have seldom heard such a lucid explanation about the graphs that i have always found very difficult so thank you deepak so we'll come to the question the question should be a kick for for you guys now so uh, the sixth question following is the indicator of gas exchange abnormality in cpet is it a low anaerobic threshold is it a low oxygen pulse is it a poor heart rate reserve or is it a fall in oxygen saturation or is it an increase in the aa gradient so this is straight out of what dr talwar has told you we've discussed this so um shouldn't be a challenge for you guys it's a difficult question though but he's talked about this through the course of this talk so deepak i have got an answer interestingly we are split out here so there's about 40% of people who say that it's a low anaerobic threshold there's 20% of people who talk about a poor heart rate reserve there's 20% who talk about an increase in aa gradient and then there's lower numbers for b and d okay so i thought gas exchange is a very good parameter to look sure. at oxygen saturation as oxygen saturation is the one which is going to fall as a gas exchange abnormal 
this is a sometimes only abnormality on the CPAT. Everything else is fine except the patient found to saturate more than 4%. And that's a clear indicator that there is a pure gas exchange abnormality. But when gas exchange abnormality is associated with cardiac limitation or respiratory limitation, then all others like low oxygen reserve and uh, low AT will all come into it. In fact, if you get low AT with a gas exchange abnormality, then you start wondering on again pulmonary hypertension as a cause because that will lead to a dual picture because otherwise a gas exchange abnormality will not occur in patients with pure congestive cardiac failure. So in or a, or a coronary artery disease for that matter. So in fact, these combinations are very important to pick up certain diseases which are beyond respiratory and cardiac. And gas exchange itself never tells us it is primarily because of alveolocapillary membrane or it is the less oxygen uptake or a less oxygen utilization. Everything comes into a gas exchange. It's a very, very big area, basically. That's why there are a lot of parameters. In fact, 50% of the uh, Wasserman graphs are only talking about gas exchange abnormalities if you look at them. So this is a disease like pulmonary vascular disease. We said pulmonary hypertension. This is most frequently we have picked up on a CPAT test when there is a young lady who comes with a dyspnea of unknown origin, which is primarily being considered as an anxiety. So when, when you look at them, they have certain cardiovascular abnormalities, like they have good breathing reserve. That will be there even in anxiety, but they have a poor stroke volume response. So the heart rate oxygen pulse is less than 70. They have this flattening of this stroke volume curve and important are they have a gas exchange abnormalities. So you start looking at their eco and you find oh eco is fraction is fine. There is nothing wrong. You this is no cardiovascular abnormality. It is anxiety. But the moment you look at gas abnormalities, you will find that the dead space ventilation, which is supposed to improve with the exercise, we are we are supposed to improve EQ ratios with exercise. In fact, they are deteriorating. So if they are deteriorating, there is a gas exchange abnormality. Then if the CO2 increases at the end of exercise, that also is an indicator of bad gas exchange in the lungs. The widening of the gradient means that more oxygen is being pulled out. That also is trying to tell us that there is a gas exchange abnormality. And fall in PaO2 or saturation is again an indicator that there is a gas exchange abnormality. So combination of these two, which are both very subtle, in will give a hint toward a pulmonary vascular disease and will lead to further right heart catheterization and picking up of these young ladies with pulmonary hypertension. In fact, we have picked up even a couple of doctors who have been uh, diagnosed as an anxiety leading to dyspnea and they had a primary pulmonary hypertension. This is a disease very frequently missed because most of the tests are normal and echo is also normal and uh, the PA pressures are not so high that they are picked up by an echocardiography. So they take a couple of years before they go and get finally diagnosed. But this test is really very good in this kind of a situation. So I think this is just to show you the gas exchange are all parameters are put together here. VDVT, saturation, and tidal carbon dioxide, oxygen and ventilatory equivalents. All these parameters are looking at gas exchange, which is happening in these patients. So you need to carefully evaluate these for patients who are purely exhibiting gas exchange abnormalities. We keep, uh, a, ventilatory can I can I ask you a question on the previous slide? So there's a question that comes in from Dr. Neeraj, our Dr. Neeraj, and he asks, how does that gas exchange depicted by a DLCO compare to what you've picked up on that particular uh, CPET testing? Yeah, so I think it is a very good question again, uh, uh, Raja. What happens is if the diffusion capacity is less than 50% of predicted, it closely matches with gas exchange abnormalities, which you particularly the desaturation part, the, the saturation, the, the fall in oxygen saturation matches with that. But if the diffusion capacity is above 50 percent in a routine exercise test, it may not be in maximal exercise test. It does correlate with that. It does correlate with that. But by and large on an exercise, it is not only the desaturation which we are going to pick up. So again, yeah, we've had a bit of a blip again. Uh, yeah, again it happened. So I think what I was trying to say is that VQ mismatch is a very important aspect of uh, uh, looking at the gas transfer issues which are happening. So in 
pulmonary hypertension that is why because it's not only the the uh, diffusion factor which is important but it is the vq mismatch which is equally important in them so that is why this is one disease where the more approach towards the gas exchange parameters is important for interpretation but it does match with the diffusion capacity if the diffusion capacity is less than 50% in an ordinary exercise test but between 50% to 80% of diffusion capacity it will only come towards the end of the maximal x will correlate thank you deepak so these are the ventilatory equivalents you can see that typically at anaerobic threshold they'll fall down and then they start increasing and these are the patterns which you see and these are the end tidal oxygen and carbon dioxide they carbon dioxide should not increase if it increases it is again a marker of a gas exchange abnormalities which is it is trying to show in this situation and there are certain other parameters of exercise limitation like patient says i have extreme leg pain back pain so these are primarily of peripheral origin anaerobic threshold less than say 40% we have already discussed st depression coming on ecgs which is simultaneously being recorded is uh, all the time coming on the second monitor is again important for coronary artery disease and abnormal blood pressure response is again one of the important factor which tells us that the exercise has to be terminated and this is the reason for the uh, circulatory factors being responsible for poor exercise test performance and uh, you can see that this is how it comes the bp response comes like this at every step these are the, all the, the steps which are being given is the when the load keeps on increasing so at every step you can see the bp is being recorded you, you can see that 110 to 82 it started and reached 180 by 101 and you can see that the bog was scale it is going on and you can see the, the all the parameters of saturation and the st segment depression coming up out here so these are again on the records which are coming up even if you have not picked up during the exercise test you can analyze again every 30 second parameters or every 30 second data can be analyzed so that brings us to the question 7 raja sure yes deepak so question 7 anaerobic threshold is characterized by is it a fall in vco2 is it an increase in vo2 is it a decrease in end tidal oxygen is it an increase in entire carbon dioxide or is it an abrupt increase in ve so i think we've gone through all of this we've spoken at length about anaerobic threshold so haven't got an answer yet deepak but uh, we'll try again see how important is anaerobic threshold is clear because there is not one method to calculate there are in fact six methods to calculate it so and this is very important in the test for the person performing the test to find out whether at was achieved or not it may not be visible on one of the graphs so that is why there are so many graphs need to be analyzed so uh, deepak about a uh, two third of people have said it's an increase in entire carbon dioxide and a third have opted for decrease in entire oxygen okay so carbon dioxide will increase that is true at uh, anaerobic threshold but what will match with that is a ventilation which is yeah. the most important thing i think the carbon dioxide the there is no problem there is and you need to get it at level very high above what and you can see it is achieved here at a very low level in 3 minute of exercise which would be like not even a uh, 20% of its very early it has been achieved so you can see even the graph is bad here which tells us so these are the other graphs which are i have showed you again the same thing you can have a ventilatory graph which is very important co2 graph again the slopes are being shown here and this end tidal ones so end tidal ones are actually you they decrease basically you can see that they are decreasing the co2 increases yes but then it start decreasing again but these are basically decreasing the the you know what we are talking about is basically the ventilatory equivalents so they will decrease towards the because the ventilation will become more efficient and the moment it becomes less efficient that is the time when it will start rising again so that's why these values will fall down with the exercise normally so step 4 is putting all together achieved normal view to whether at was there if at was there it is low or normal is there a cardiovascular limitation is it ventilatory limitation is it a gas exchange limitation or it is a combination of cardio respiratory limitation 
or cardiac and a gas exchange limitation or a respiratory and a gas exchange limitation and very importantly will come either it is poor conditioning or there is a like patient is deconditioned or there is some muscular limitation or a poor effort so all of this has to be put together in the last step when we start interpreting so this is a little complicated graph i think i have just put it because the slides will be available to you people you can go through it but again it is trying to tell you the same thing look at two reserves the heart rate reserve and the breathing reserve if the breathing reserve is not there or reduced which is expected to be like 30% then obviously there is a ventilatory limitation and at that point of time the heart rate reserve will be still there so if the heart rate reserve is not left behind it can be a cardiac limitation no problem you need to go ahead and look at the oxygen pulse which is the stroke volume if that is flat it is okay you try to look for the anaerobic threshold if anaerobic threshold also came in early then obviously it is a cardiac limit if the anaerobic if the oxygen pulse is okay but the anaerobic threshold came early then that is a muscular factor that there is a muscle issues and the patient needs to be evaluated for his muscular myopathies or perhaps a poor conditioning which is again a very important cause so by and large these three four things are very important and then comes the gas exchange abnormalities so that brings us to the question number 8 about the respiratory limitation raja so what is yeah sure deepak so what is the indicator of respiratory being the limiting factor to exercise in copd is it a decrease in respiratory reserve is it termination of cpet due to dyspnea is it early anaerobic threshold or is it normal ventilatory efficiency so deepak while we are waiting for that question i'll quickly address something else that people have asked in the meantime so people have asked that you talked about various surrogate markers for acidosis in the way of anaerobic threshold you've talked about the entitled carbon dioxide the entitled oxygen as surrogate markers of po2 and pso2 so people are asking whether it can replace an abg completely or do you still in some cases need an abg as a part and parcel of a cpet testing so raja we don't do the abgs now because what you need to put in is actually an arterial cannula to draw the abgs every 2 minutes in them and that disrupts the exercise test itself because if the patient's attention gets drawn at that point of time they start hyperventilating and things like that so initially you know when we were trying to calibrate the machines and our our own experience couple of tests we even did with the cannulas there and many times we even put in a pa swan gans catheter because some of the patients who had swan gans you can actually calculate the cardiac output so you can have a stroke volume you can have a cardiac output and then you try to match it by and large the values are like 5% up and down and since it is the response which you are looking at rather than a single value so there is no point in doing the invasive actually if you do this invasive parameters then the entire uh the idea of doing cpat as a non invasive test is yeah. gone completely gone so that is why i think that we should keep the all the invasive things as less as possible and uh, arterial blood gas and there are people who have done even with the pa catheters to looking at pulmonary circulation cardiac output and pulmonary vascular resistance but ultimately this these they make the things more complicated and doesn't help you much so right. that is why to make it simple and less invasive as far as possible is the is the is the beauty of the test i suppose sure sure so i've got thank you deepak so i've got responses now so again it's a split again so um indicator of respiratory being the limiting factor to exercise in copd the largest number have talked about decreased respiratory reserve that which is good i guess there's a 30% people who talked about early anaerobic threshold and then this 20% who've said termination of cpet due to dyspnea and then there's about 10% who've talked about this being a normal ventilatory efficiency okay so i think i'll quickly uh, uh, tell that uh, people who oh, large number have already picked up correctly it is a respiratory reserve always the respiratory reserve is the important aspect in the respiratory limitation dyspnea may be reason for termination of cpat into any cause whether it is cardiac or anything so it does not matter early anaerobic threshold does not happen in respiratory disease the problem is the anaerobic threshold doesn't happen in respiratory disease because the test is terminated too soon like sometimes we calculate these people they are only able to do 50 watts so what we need to do is practically we need to give them 
uh, less than five watts per minute so to able to achieve that 10 minutes of exercise test and they terminate the test at seven minutes. So at seven minutes, they are still in aerobic metabolism. So anaerobic metabolism hasn't happened at all in respiratory cases. So in patients with COPD, it is very difficult to elicit anaerobic threshold in them because they do not do the exercise up to that level. They terminate prior to that and they terminate because there is no respiratory reserve left in them because their FEV1 is like 30%. So you multiply with the uh, 35 and you get to MVV, which is so low that it is almost and the basal levels are already high. They are already 800 ml. So the moment you start increasing it, they reach 1200 and finish. The test is already finished. So that is why it is very difficult to perform 10 minute test to them to look for anaerobic threshold because it is very important. If it comes early, then there is an associated cardiac limitation in them. That is becomes very important. And ventilatory efficiency is a gas exchange parameter. It can be there in severe COPD also, no doubt about it. But it is primarily indicating that how well the lungs are able to handle increased carbon dioxide. And obviously, the lungs which are poor will not be able to do a good ventilatory efficiency there. So this is like a chart which we are trying to share. So you can see here, the, the important aspect is that you can see that there is no breathing reserve left here. It's just finished. So then you see the ventilatory response, which is also acute. You can see that anaerobic threshold has come in. The gas exchange abnormalities are again coming in. So this is like a pattern which you get in patients with COPD. This is a COPD pattern. That brings us to the next question that, uh, which is here, uh, Raja, you can see. So Deepak, disease specific questions. We've got some, so last 15 minutes, we've got some very interesting questions from not just the country, but outside. So we need to keep some time for that. So quick comments from you, Deepak, after the question, maybe. So, so I think we can rush through these questions. Yeah. Yeah. So shall we do that? So yeah. indication of respiratory being the limiting factor for exercise in interstitial lung disease here. So is it termination of CPET due to dyspnea? Is it early anaerobic threshold? Is it normal ventilatory efficiency? Or is it an increase in the PO2, PO2, so alveolar arterial gradient at the end of exercise? So which one do you think is the right answer? And Deepak, maybe a couple of comments while we are waiting for the answers to come in. So I think uh, now uh, you see that interstitial lung disease, when we are talking about it is a gas exchange abnormality we are talking about. So the, uh, the, the important issue will be the dyspnea again is going to be there everywhere. It's, it's going to be all. Early anaerobic threshold will mean only again a cardiac limitation or a very, very poor muscle power of the patient. So you need to consider that in those situations. Ventilatory efficiency is going to be poor in interstitial lung disease also. So I think we can move on to the, quickly to the next one, Raja. Is that sure? A, sure. Because I think for sake the of audience is, the audience has got it right though. So brilliant. Okay. So let's go to the next one. So you can look at this, you know, see the, these are gas exchange abnormalities are the most important things which are happening. And these are the graphs. You can see end tidal PCO2, PO2 graph. As I told you that these are the gas exchange abnormalities, ventilatory equivalents, which are abnormal in this situation. And you can see that in this situation, the, although you, this cardiac graph is actually going on here, but there is no clear cut cardiac limitation, which is coming in. But uh, yes, there is an anaerobic threshold, which is coming up here. So we move on to the, I think we'll leave this uh, one or two questions, which are really more difficult, like pulmonary hypertension. We may yeah. come to something like a uh, heart failure. I think this is important. We can go for this. Sure. So indicator of limiting factor to exercise in congestive heart failure. Is it termination of CPET due to chest pain? Is it normal anaerobic threshold? Is it normal ventilatory efficiency? Or is it shallow oxygen pulse slow? And again, Deepak, you've sp spoken about this in length. So maybe a carry home message for the audience about congestive heart failure. Yeah, so I think we had for the respiratory breathing reserve. So we have another one very important here, which we have already discussed, which is a surrogate marker of stroke volume is an oxygen pulse. And that's what we are trying to show you in this graph. You can just look at it. It's just flat. It did not rise at all, actually, the oxygen pulse. So you, when you look at the straight graph of stroke volume, it gives you an idea that nothing has happened as far as this is concerned. And the heart rate was the only one which tried to increase the cardiac output there. So this is a typical graph of the what we get in a cardiac disease. And Deepak, you'll be happy to know that people have been listening to you. 
that's a hundred percent answering oh, the oxygen okay. pulse. So great. brilliant. <laughs> so you can see the early eighty also here. You can see that it has crossed very early. This so early eighty and all these things together are there. But then you need the basic ones to look into that. So I think we can leave the other ones. I'll quickly come to this last algorithm to interpret that you look at the peak VO2. If it is less than 80%, then obviously there is some exercise limitation. You go down the graph. But if it is more than 85%, anxiety, obesity, and a very mild disease can still be there. Obesity can be corrected when you correct the VO2 by per kg. Anxiety, you can look at into the VCO2 graph, V over VCO2 graph, which will show hyperventilation, but which shows that there is excessive ventilation, which is washing out carbon dioxide. When you look at the low, you look at immediately anaerobic threshold. If anaerobic threshold is low, you look at the breathing reserve. If the breathing reserve is also low, then there is a mixed disease, cardiac as well as respiratory. But if breathing reserve is normal and anaerobic threshold has come early, then this is a circulatory cardiac impairment which we are talking about. On the other hand, if the anaerobic threshold is normal or it has not been achieved and the breathing reserve is low, then it is lungs. However, if it is achieved, it is normal and breathing reserve is also normal, then either patient has not put in enough effort, you immediately go back to RER, see whether it is more than 1.1 or not. Deconditioning can be very important here. Again, you have the volume graph, O2 pulse. If the O2 pulse is good, then it is deconditioning, not because of the heart condition. And now look at the ECG if it is because of the coronary artery. This is the American Heart Association thing which is coming up. So we can have the questions now, I think. So Deepak, Deepak, that's brilliant. So from that, the last algorithm that you've got on the screen there, Deepak, I guess there could be overlaps, isn't it? And I guess overlaps will make it more difficult. You know, so it's overlap of see about airways disease with coronary very artery true. disease. Yeah. It's very true, Raja, because the life is not that simple as the American Heart Association has made it. They have made it like you only look at two things. You look at VO2, you look at anaerobic threshold, you look at breathing reserve, and that's the end of it. It doesn't happen that way. Sure. So Deepak, we'll take just a few questions. There's quite a few actually. So I will take a few. Uh, we've got about five or seven minutes left. So Dr. Radha Munje again asks a question which is related to safety. So COVID times, what about filters or sensors attached to the mouthpiece when you're doing the test. Are you using them at uh, Metro or are you sort of going the conventional way? Yeah, no, we are using the wire filters. They were there before also. And we did confirm that, that uh, it's basically during the COVID times, it's basically the mask. And the mask has to be sterilized every time in individual patient. The same mask cannot be used again. So it's entire and the gases are actually, you know, uh, they are going through a filter into the uh, from the from sorry, from the mask there outside the mask. If they have to come, they come through a filter. So basically, if you think that the breathing pattern will uh, uh, breathing uh, of this uh, uh, breathing in this mask will lead to uh, dissemination of the virus uh, because there is a filter and that filter is again the same viral filter which we use for our uh, body box and other uh, other uh, equipment also and that's good enough for using it actually but as a standard protocol we after every test we open the windows let them be all sanitized and then restart again but mask has to be sterilized in fact it is eto it has to be eto every time we use it so we have a couple of masks if like we have to do two to three cases in a day so three different masks will be used and then they'll be sent for eto they'll be all sa sanitized and then only they'll come so just like the PFTs, you would actually have about a half an hour, 40 minute gap between individual procedure for sort of aerosol dissemination. Right? Okay. That, yeah, I do not know how good it is, Raja. You only know it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we follow this at the yeah, moment. Yeah, sure. Sure. So, do, I mean, we do the same for our PFTs. So there's this question about blood pressure and what sort of rise and what sort of fall is significant. So Dr. Mohammed Rahim Hussain has asked that question uh, from Sikandrabad. So what's relevant, what, what, what blood pressure rise or fall would be relevant to you? Okay, I think it's a, again a very pertinent question because in fact the BP response is one of the indicators to terminate the test. And what is that BP response? So when the BP shoots up to more than 210 of systolic and more than 100 
infection of diastolic, we stop the test. That's the criteria for stopping the test because of the abnormal hypertensive response on an exercise. And we do report it that this patient had a response. Patient may not be hypertensive, but has a hypertensive response. What does it mean? It means a poor sympathetic response in an individual patient. And fall in blood pressure is very, very significant. You need to immediate terminate the test. So if there is more than consistently, if there is more than 20 millimeter fall in systolic blood pressure, again, we terminate the test at that point. So sustained means that uh, two consecutive readings. Right. So there's another question, which is actually from an international audience, Deepak, and I'll finish off with that. So uh, there's Dr. Mohammad Abdul Bais from Dhaka, who asks about an arterial alveolar arterial oxygen gradient which might be due to an intrapulmonary shunt and is there a way of picking that up on a cardiopulmonary exercise testing yes yes very good question but very difficult it can be picked up by looking at other gas exchange abnormalities associated with it then intrapulmonary shunt or intracardiac shunts can also be picked up by that this is a little more sophisticated because then you need to calculate the slopes so I didn't include that. I think for that, we need to have far advanced CPAT. Sure. <laughs> Where individually, sure. every graph, the slope is calculated. And if the slope doesn't come up to the level of the gas exchange parameters, that is calculated for shunting of blood. It is possible, yeah. Grand. So I think we'll uh, leave it at that, Deepak. So thank you very much. I actually learned a lot there. There's lots of messages here where people have said they've learned a lot in the last two hours today. So thank you. Thank you very much for the entire module, but especially that one CPET one, which I actually, like I said, learned a lot. Um, the Indian Chess Society is very pleased to be endorsing a program like this. Um, and I hope there'll be a time in the not so distant future when we'll have more programs like this coming from your side. Thank you, Raja. But I'll tell you one thing. I, the entire audience must admit this thing that uh, I couldn't have got a better moderator than Raja himself today with a, with a very, very, you know, I was like, I was not very sure that how to approach you for this. I would let me take the courage and ask Raja for it because there are certain people who will take the challenges and will definitely tread onto an uncomfortable this is an uncomfortable zone. Every Absolutely. time I come onto a CPAT platform, it is uncomfortable for me because I have to talk so much and I'm, 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 people will get pulled by these graphs the moment they see it. And it is, it is very difficult on, a, on, a, on a, uh, this kind of a platform. You know, if it's one to one, then it becomes very easy to make them understand those kind of graphs. But this kind of a platform, it was difficult on an advanced uh, CPFT. And on the top of it, uh, getting Raja was my challenge that I wanted. <laughs> and he agreed. And he agreed. On the first instance, he agreed. So I think the, I, I think I will, I will have, I have no words to express my gratitude uh, to come on the, this thing today and uh, wonderfully help me to pass through this difficult test of doing this CPAT advanced course today. Thank you, Raja. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. And with this, we come to an end of this series of four advanced lung function tests. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much.